This is the third part of our content on long-term memory structure, and this is on implicit memory. So we put together this little organizational system of long-term memory. We contextualized it with short-term memory in the last lecture. And so long-term memory we think of as explicit. And in the book, we break it into these episodic things, the personal events, and the semantic things, facts and knowledge that we have. We're going to talk now about our implicit memory, our functions, our memory functions that are not conscious and not effortful. And we'll talk specifically about procedural memory, about priming, and about conditioning. So implicit memory, it's a type of long-term memory that refers to information that we remember unconsciously and without effort, but that can nevertheless affect behavior. So dialing a familiar phone number, we might do it without even looking, certainly without thinking. Maybe not anymore because everything is in our phones now, right? But maybe accessing your phone and getting your contact info, it might be the same. Um, if you smell a particular scent that triggers a range of memory and emotion, it might motivate you to go buy that popcorn, implicit memory. Or using vocabulary like once you learn a lot about psychology, there will be some terms that will be really familiar to you, and you might use them all the time, like STM. After a while, you might automatically know that short-term memory. You won't even think about it. It'll just be unconscious. And so this little image uh, breaks out this explicit memory, things that you're consciously working to remember, including your episodes in your life, and implicit memory, like you know this, the words to this song you're not giving any thought to. So we'll start with procedural memory as a type of implicit memory. And procedural memory um, is just memory of how to do things. Um, often juxtaposed to declarative memory, which refers to memory of facts, meaning they're kind of up against each other. So we have to, rem you, you know, we do know how to do these things semantically, which is a type of declarative memory, but our body does them without our thinking. Um, so riding a bike, you maybe didn't ride for 30 years and you still know how. That's procedural memory, your body remembers. I'll tell you, picking up my saxophone after 30 some years, my fingers still knew what to do, my mouth wasn't so sure. Um, if you're a piano player and there's a song you've practiced a lot, you can do it while you're talking to someone or daydreaming or thinking about something else, same as driving a car. Once a child in elementary school has learned to tie their shoes, they can do it even when they're not thinking, even when they're, they're saying, just wait, just wait, I'm almost there. They can do that automatically. So those are all procedural memories. So you'll know, I, I don't know if you remember this from an earlier class, but um, once our procedural memory is for how to do something is strong, it requires much less attention. And so just to go back to that experiment, I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, so you'll recall that this was a study, um, and it was looking at neuroplasticity, about how we form new pathways. But it was just 23 college students randomly assigned to two groups. Group A was taught to juggle till they could juggle for 60 seconds nonstop. And group B, well, there's group A again. And group B was not taught to juggle. They just lived their normal lives. And what happened in the brain? Well, after a week, the motor cortex in the jugglers grew significantly, so their brain actually changed. After 28 days of practice, their motor cortex kept the new sides. After two months without cortex, they lost some of their ability. Their motor cortex declined. They retained some ability to do the skill, so some procedural memory. What to make note of is right here. When they were first learning the skill, they had to give a lot of attention to it, a lot of energy to it. And correspondingly, that region of the brain grew. Once they stopped learning something new, but they were just expanding how much they knew, but they're no longer learning the new skill, they weren't giving as much attention to it. Their motor cortex retained those pathways, but they no longer were using all the energy we needed to grow. And of course, without practice, it returned to its original size. So procedural memory, while a new skill is being learned, requires a lot of attention, utilizes a lot of energy in the brain. But once it's learned, 
that region of the brain retains that skill even long after we've used it, like the bike riding example. So expert induced amnesia. Um, so this is a really interesting idea. What it means is that the skills become so automatic that we no longer remember how to do them. So imagine walking is something that you all do well. Imagine if you had to teach someone how to walk, would you be able to break the task apart enough to be able to teach it? Or what about teaching someone how to hold their fork? Like what fingers are you actually using, right? And for me, I came across this. I have a really long yoga practice, a pretty serious, very intense for 30 years. I find it hard to teach yoga because I learned the words by listening to my yoga teacher. So I don't do too bad with it, but it's so much in my body that it's hard for me to even think back to what were the foundational skills or what were the things that were struggles at the beginning. So I would say that if it's learned well or learned with ease, it's harder to teach. Um, I had to work really hard to develop the skills I needed to learn statistics. I didn't take enough classes when I was young and so forth and so on. So I worked really hard. And I actually think that makes me a better teacher of early level mathematics than if I was an expert mathematician. Because I think an expert math mathematician would have expert induced amnesia and wouldn't be able to remember what the fundamental skills were or what people might struggle with. And then for me, writing and reading came really easily to me. I can't remember much about learning either one of those. It came easily. I don't think I teach writing very well. It's hard for me to, uh, to know where people run into problems. And I think there's expert induced amnesia for me. And then I want to invite you to think back to the sculpture in week two we read about. And I wonder if there was any expert induced amnesia going on there. Remember, those experts just knew there was something wrong and they couldn't put a finger on it. And so that might be an example of expert induced amnesia. So next we talk about priming as another example of implicit memory. And so priming, the way it's defined in your book, sounds so boring, but the ideas are really fascinating. So priming in your book is defined as when the presentation of one stimulus, the priming stimulus, changes a person's response to another stimulus, the test stimulus. And so I'll just give you a couple of examples. There's so many fascinating examples that use priming. Um, so Levy and colleagues were interested in whether older people could be primed to do better on a memory test. And so what they did in this prime is they, um, get, they quote unquote primed images of old people as forgetful or as old people as wise by having them read articles. So one article might be reading about an old people who was forgetful, another one about an old people who were wise. So they primed images. And these are older people reading these articles. And then they just gave them a test of memory. And they found that, yeah, people who read the articles about the wise old person were primed at an implicit level and they actually did better on a memory test. A second example, you might be aware of stereotypes threat studies. Steele and colleagues primed black and white students at a prestigious university to become aware of their race. So all they did is primed race awareness and all the stereotypes that go with that. And the only way they primed it is the people had to check a box indicating their race before taking a difficult test. So they just became, race was made salient. And they found out that black students who were primed with race before taking the test performed significantly worse. So priming effects. So priming is thought of as implicit memory because they activate memory about what someone is unaware. So one way you're, I'm going back to what your book talks about, they can use repetition priming. That is, whatever they're primed with, they're trying to make the person aware of that in the future. So for example, if you see a lot of words linked to failure, then later on when you're given a test, you might more quickly pick out failure-oriented words. 
And we know that primes are implicit, not explicit, because we can test people with amnesia. We can ask, in fact, I'm going to do the task with you, at least I'm going to run you through it. But we can ask participants to read a 10 word list and rate how much they like each word. And I'm going to go forward and do the task and tell you about it then. So I'd like you to conduct this task, actually participate in it, just to see what happens. So number your paper from 1 to 15, and I'm going to show you words one at a time, and all I want you to do is rate how much you like each word. I mean, I don't know what criteria you'll give it. One would be not at all, five would be very much. So just rank after numbering your paper 1 to 15, you're just going to rate how much you like each word. So bark. How much do you like it? One to five. Watch. Puck. Frigid. Number five is angel. Six is share. Seven is pride. Eight is trait. Sorry about that. Nine is drive. Ten is shawl. Eleven is shore. Which do you like that word? Twelve is blind. Which do you like that word? Thirteen is smoke. Fourteen is knack. And 15 is slop. Did you like that word? So now your next task is to again number your paper 1 to 15 and complete each of the word stems. So just fill in each of these word stems to make a complete word. And what I recommend you do is to pause your video right now so that you can finish this task. So pause right now, and if you're all done, you can continue. And I'm going to go ahead and talk about the task now. So what we would expect to find is that, first off, we gave you the first word list and we asked you to rate your liking for them in order to prevent you from trying to memorize them. So we tried to distract your attention a little bit from memorizing them. And now, because you're primed with these words, even though they might need not be the most common answer, you should be more likely to finish the words in this way. So for example, number two, W-A-T, a really common ending for that might be E-R, water. But because you were primed, you just saw the word watch, you might fill it in W-A-T-C-H. For P blank blank K, pick, might be a really common, or park would be more common, but you just saw the word puck, and so you would be more likely to fill that word in. Likewise, number four, the word was frigid, but a much more common answer might have been friend. So which one did you do? And so that's what we're looking at here, and this is called repetition priming, because you just saw the words and you're asked to repeat it. So just seeing the words, is that enough to get you to be more likely to repeat it? So when we did a task like the one on the previous page with people in three different conditions, um, the three con these are the results we saw, and the three conditions were people with amnesia, people with Korsakoff syndrome, which is a really severe form of alcohol, memory, memory problems that results from long-term severe alcohol abuse. And they would have problems both with anti-retrograde and retrograde amnesia. And then that's the AMN group. We compared them with inpatients without amnesia and alcoholic controls who were alcoholic but did not have amnesia. So these two groups, the INPT and ALC groups, didn't have amnesia. And so as far as recalling the number of words, we can see those who had amnesia couldn't do it. They had lost their capacity to form memories of these words. But on the implicit memory test, when we suggested those words to them and asked them to rate their liking and put them into their minds as just implicit memories, the ones with amnesia who couldn't form new memories were still more likely to 
respond with the word stems that were suggested in the list they had just looked at. So that's how we know that implicit memory has different pathways than the explicit memory in the first test. And so the last thing we look at is classical conditioning. And classical conditioning is, one example is this dreaded air puff test. And maybe you've been to the eye doctor when they test you for glaucoma, but if not, what they do is they ask you to look, keep your eyes open and look directly into this. And then they do, do a quick puff and it blows air right into your cornea. And it feels weird and nobody likes it. And what do you think happens? What do you think people really tend to do if they can? They tend to blink. You don't want a puff of air in your eye. So what happens pretty automatically without any planning, you blink. And hopefully they get one. Sometimes they have to do a couple tries to get that puff right on your cornea. Now, let's imagine what happens that you're going to have to have this 10 times in one eye, 10 times in a row. And each time, just before they puff the air, a little buzzer goes off. So it's beep, puff, beep, puff. What do you think is going to happen each time the buzzer goes off? In time, you're going to associate the buzzer with the puff and blink. Now, the reason that this is considered classical conditioning is that there's no reason in natural phenomena that a buzzer should cause you to blink, right? We hear buzzers go off all the time. We hear bells on our phones and they don't cause us to blink. But now your implicit memory has formed an association between that buzzer and this puff of air. So now the buzzer causes you to blink. And this might last some time, even long after. If you hear that buzzer again, you know, a week later, it might cause you to blink, even though there's no puff of air about to happen. And that's what we call classical conditioning. And the classic example of classical conditioning is Pavlov's dogs. And this is just works like this. You know, there's a natural response when a dog encounters food, their mouth produces saliva. And this is a natural response. It's good. It gives the dog digestive enzymes to work with the food and to process it. And if we, and that's called an unconditioned stimulus. So just like the eye puff was the unconditioned stimulus for your blink, so is the food the unconditioned stimulus for the dog salivating. And the unconditioned response is the saliva, just like for you, the blink is the unconditioned response. It's natural, it's good. But then the dog learns what predicts food. So let's say that every time we store, we store this food in a cupboard and every time we open the cupboard, there's a little squeak and then along comes the food and the dog salivates. All right. And so the dog learns that the squeak of the cupboard predicts food. So there's the cupboard, there's the squeak. And now let's say we move the food. And so now we still have the squeak of the cupboard, but we have no food. Is the dog gonna still salivate in response to the sound of the cupboard? And the answer is, yeah. For a while, the dog is still going to salivate in response to the cupboard. And we call it the conditioned stimulus, conditioning meaning, conditioning meaning learning. So the dog has learned that the cupboard predicts food. This isn't a natural thing. It's, it's, it's not like food causing salivation. That's natural. That's a natural phenomenon that the body responding to food. But now we have the body producing saliva in response to a certain squeak. And that's just like you blinking in response to the buzzer. And so that's the condition response to the condition stimulus. It's learned. So how is classical conditioning related to implicit memory? Well, we can think about it as um, you're not consciously pulling out that response to the buzzer that predicts the, um, I, the puff of air and then the eye blink. So it's not conscious and it is recalled. So sometime later, you still might respond to that buzzer with a blink. And so that makes its memory and says it's not effortful. That means it's implicit memory. So to summarize, implicit memory is memory that's effortless and automatic. And we talked about procedural memory, uh, priming, and classical conditioning.